الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله إن شاء الله although the topic of قياس is a very powerful topic however that's not my topic <laughs> so إن شاء الله I will be addressing the topic that I was assigned بإذن الله تعالى as human beings we are one of Allah Jalla Jalalu's creations and as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, He has made us unique in various ways. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah says, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa, that verily I will place on this earth a vicegerent. So one of the significant qualities of the human being is that we are vicegerents of Allah. We are representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ that verily we have dignified the son of Adam. And when the ulama come to understand how the son of Adam or how the human being is dignified, they look immediately at the intellect. And what makes the human being unique amongst the creations or amidst the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that the human being is a being that intellects. We think, we have volition, we can have metacognition, we can think about thoughts and so on. And today, as human beings, when we look out in the world, we see what is seemingly the powerful impact of the human mind. We are mesmerized by the qualities and the things that we are able to research, think about nanotechnologies, getting to the moon, etc. Remarkable things, but from our simple human perspective. However, as Muslims, to truly comprehend the capacity, the role, and the duty of the intellect, we have to turn back to our tradition. And we have to turn back to Islam, and we have to turn back to its creator to inform to us what the true role and the capacity of the intellect within the realm of the dunya. And to do this, we go back to the beginning, to the beginning of revelation, when the Prophet وسلم, as we all know, in his late 30s, began to go to Ghar Hira. And he found himself going there regularly, seeking. Because although from a social perspective, he had it all. He was comfortable. He was socially viable. He was married to the prestigious Lady Khadija. He was someone who had good business. He had children. They had just rebuilt the Kaaba. And so he was of standing in society. However, as we all know, he was still seeking. He was lost. He wanted something more. He needed something more. So he went to Ghar Hira. And he spent the years in Ghar Hira seeking, looking. And as our mother Aisha tells us, He began to enjoy that. Until that one majestic day, when Jibreel alayhi salam descended in his majestic form and he grasped the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he commanded him to do one simple thing, iqra, read. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam responds in a simple but profound way. And this is where I want us to really focus our attention. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam responds by saying, ma ana biqari. I am not someone who knows how to read, subhanallah. The first response that the ultimate human being, Sayyidul Bashar, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the ultimate person who may intellect, his first response to revelation is what? Submission, negation of ability. He negated himself. He negated his ability to read. And because by the way, as Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali and others have told us, this command to read is not simply reading the lettered word. Because as Imam Abu Hamid says, there is Kitabullah al Mastur and Kitabullah al Mandur. There is the book of Allah that is lettered and lined, but there is the book of Allah that is seen. And so, when the Prophet is being commanded to read, he is being commanded to do both of these simultaneously. And his response to that command is what? I don't know how to, subhanAllah. And so that is the first response from a human mind, from the human intellect to 
the revelation. Not only did the Prophet ﷺ engage in what we call intellectual submission in that moment, however, he also engaged in physical submission because Jibreel grasped him once and twice and three times. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Hatta balagani al jahd, until I thought I was going to faint. And so he engaged in not only intellectual submission, but physical submission, as well as spiritual submission. Because our mother Aisha tells us, He began to enjoy going to Ghar Hira, and he found spiritual nourishment in that. However, when Jibreel alayhi salam descended in the way that he did, and grasped him in the way that he did, and shocked him in the way that he did, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He rushed to Our Lady Khadija, Sayyida Khadija, and he says, Inni akhafu ala nafsi, I fear for myself. And she says, Kalla, la yuhzik Allahu abada, Allah will never forsake you. And she began to explain to him why. And so, brothers and sisters, we must appreciate that the human being, the initial and immediate response of any human being who intellects, who has the capacity to intellect, must enter into complete holistic submission to revelation. Because that is what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. Our, our guide, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he entered into that holistic submission. And then brothers and sisters, Jibreel alayhi salam reveals to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam how he is to move forward. Because the Prophet said three times, Ma ana biqari'. I am not one who knows how to read. And so Jibreel gives him the secret sauce, if you will. He says, Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. If you are going to come and read, or if you're even going to begin to know how to read, it is only going to be in the name of your Rabb, your Khaliq, Allahu Jalla Jalala. And so the ba, as the ulama will say, has up to 12 to 15 meanings of what this letter ba in bismi rabbika means. And from the meanings is ba ul isti'ana, read bi awnillah, by the aid of Allah, or read ba bu sababiyya, read bi sababillah, by the, by the design of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, read bismillah, read in the name of Allah. So ya Muhammad, the only way you can read and understand this dunya is by Allah, by the aid of Allah, in the name of Allah. That is the only way to look out into this dunya. And so brothers and sisters, this leads us immediately to appreciate and understand what is the role of the intellect in our lives. And the first role of the intellect is to enter into submission to its creator. Because the intellect is a created entity and it must submit to its creator. The intellect is not independent of Allah Jalla Jalalu. So it is not a conversation between reason and revelation, but rather reason in submission to revelation. That's what we have to understand. Because it makes no other sense otherwise. Because it is a creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so the first thing that we must do is look and see what is then the high purpose of this intellect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes no ambiguities about it. He says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the jinn or the human except to worship. So our duty is to worship Allah. And as Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu would say, لِيَعْبُدُونَ أَيْ لِيَعْرِفُونَ لِيَعْبُدُونَ means to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to enter into knowledge of Allah in submission to Allah. And then, when we enter into that submission to move forward in life, to move forward into the dunya, into this created world, so for this created entity, the intellect, to travel through the created world, it must be by and through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so as human beings, we realize the capacity of the human mind. Because Allah, Allah Jalla Jalalu tells us in the Quran, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who taught Adam all the names. All of the knowledge that is in this dunya, that is in this world, that has been taught to Adam, has come to us from who? Allahu Jalla Jalalu. 
not, the in, not some big intellect mind independent of Allah. Abadan, hashalillah. It is the creation of Allah and Allah placed in it knowledge. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And you have not been given from knowledge, but a little. All we have from the knowledge is very little. And Khidr gave a very beautiful illustration to Musa alayhi salam. When he took a needle and he dipped it in the ocean, he dipped it in the ocean, he pulled it out, and he told Musa, do you see what came out with this needle? He said, yes, a droplet of water. He said, your knowledge and our knowledge compared to the knowledge of Allah is like this droplet of water compared to the ocean. That our knowledge is insignificant and minimal with regards to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, this brings me into our modern moment. When today we have an exaggerated idea of the capacity of the human mind. Today there is a ta'lih. There is, we have made the intellect an ilah. Whereas the reality of the intellect and the full capacity and the, and the intellect coming into full fruition can only come in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, submission does not mean omission or deletion. When we say the intellect submits to its creator, we are not saying that this intellect is to be deleted. No. It is simply to understand that the only way that this intellect can realize its full potential is when it is dictated by its creator and when it is directed by its creator. And if you really want to appreciate the full intellectual production within Islamic fiqh or the Islamic sciences or the Islamic arts, philosophy and so on, you look back into our intellectual heritage. Because if we look back and we look at the likes of Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, Imam al-Juwaini, Imam al-Razi, Imam ibn Taymiyyah, these were polymaths of their time. Truly, remarkably knowledgeable people. And if you look at someone like Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, what he was able to accomplish was truly remarkable. Because if we're going to begin to think of how the intellect is to be used in the modern world, we must stand on the shoulders of our giants of the past because they truly were giants and that is not hyperbole and we sometimes reduce the capacity of these ulama to simple they were men and we were men because we are disconnected from that heritage but if you look and I direct you to one work by Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali Al-Munqidh min al-Dalal or the deliverance from error you will see profundity at play you will see how Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali was able to consume all of the pervading philosophies of his time. Every single philosophy that existed, Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali knew it full well. And he knew it so well that he became authorities even for those people themselves. That his writings and his works in falsafa and in kalam and in so on became the authoritative texts during that time. So when you read the book, The Deliverance from Error, you see how Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali elevated above his time. Where he showed us how when the intellect is in submission to its creator, can truly elevate above all. And can produce remarkably beautiful things. And when we look throughout Islamic history, we see the production of philosophy, we see the production of logic, we see the production of arts and sciences, we see people who understood psychology and sociology and anthropology, and they were able to speak at the highest of levels because they had a deep appreciation for the role of the intellect. Then, brothers and sisters, and this leads me into my final point. Today, as a Muslim community, and the reason why we even bring up such topics in our conferences is because we have problems in our societies. We struggle with many of our realities. We struggle with the day-to-day -day life as being a Muslim in the modern world. However, brothers and sisters, all too often when we talk about the intellect, we immediately direct our attention towards what? Fiqh. We immediately direct our attention towards fiqh, as if fiqh or fiqhi solutions are the solutions to our problems. 
I posit that the reality is otherwise. Perhaps, yes, fiqh is a part of the solution to our challenges that we face today. And yes, we have to develop sophisticated fiqh to deal with certain realities of our time. However, brothers and sisters, however, we have to come into full appreciation of our reality before we rush to make concessions and decisions. The ulama, they have a profoundly beautiful principle. They say, al-hukmu ala shay'i faru'un an tasawurihi. That to judge a given matter, it is simply an extension of having a tasawur of that matter. Being able to perceive and understand that issue. And so for us to begin to talk about solutions for the American Muslim community, or the Western Muslim community, or the Muslim community as a whole, it cannot be relegated to fuqaha and shiyukh giving fiqhi concessions to make things halal or haram. That cannot be where we relegate the duty of our intellectual shari production. It is much greater and much higher than that. We have to understand that modern society is the production of ve it is the production of very specific philosophies very specific philosophies that undergird what the modern world is. It is of the likes of Kant and Hume. Read these people's philosophies and you'll see so many connections between what is happening in the world today and simple human philosophy. It is philosophy such as secular humanism, individualism, capitalism, scientism. Science today is no longer a tool of discovery in the material realm, but rather it is a religion. Science today is taken as a deen, a way of life. Whereas we must realize that if we come and all we say, and to use the language of Dr. Ramadan, all we say that our duty is to adapt, then we are cutting ourselves off at the knees. Our duties as Muslims is not adaptive, but rather it is transformative in nature. Our duty is not simply to come into a given society and just find fiqhi concessions that allow us to plug in. That's not the role of Islam throughout the centuries. The role of Islam has always been transformative in nature. And so perhaps when we come to consider our solutions and the solutions that we need, we go beyond simply assessing fiqh and fatwa, but rather we go into the realm of philosophy and we begin to question the philosophies and understand the philosophies that inform many of the decisions that we make as Muslims in America and Muslims in the West in general. Because many of the concessions that we seek to make are driven by philosophies that are not informed by the Islamic heritage. So when we come and we say, Ya Shaykh, give me a fatwa that will allow me to engage in riba to buy myself a big sprawling $3 million mansion, I will say perhaps you don't need a fatwa that allows you to engage in something that is haram. Perhaps the discussion must be why do you feel compelled to buy such a sprawling mansion in the first place? What are the philosophies that are informing this idea of breaking away from city centers and moving into sprawling mansions that are not practical by any stretch of the imagination, that exhaust electricity, that exhaust natural resources, that are not productive, that break societies apart, people living in big mansions independent of one another? Who informed this philosophy? Who defined and designed how the modern world operates? Perhaps before we decide that I have to buy this mega mansion, perhaps I decide who is telling me that I need to buy it in the first place. And so perhaps, yes, I don't need to go and look for a fiqhi concession that will allow me to buy it, but rather questioning deeply why I even think of buying it in the first place. And that must be applied across the board. When we think of a lot of the very challenging topics of our time, feminism, capitalism, etc., all of the isms, they are not simply a fiqhi conversation. They are philosophical, they are anthropological, they are sociological, they are very deep conversations that have to be had. And so we must go to our religion and not simply seek to submit it to a modern reality, but realistically we have to go to our religion for it to inform the philosophy that will guide us through the world that we live in. And we see this most beautifully. And to, to really emphasize this idea of the transformative versus the adaptive, we go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We go to where we started. Because when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered into society, 
he wasn't seeking just to adapt. And his duty and his command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not, Ya Muhammad, you are simply to adapt into society as it is. No, you are to, to transform society. And so you are to engage in all sorts of intellectual endeavors that will help you transform the reality that you live in. And so perhaps instead of just going and looking for a fiqhi concession, we go and we talk seriously about the philosophies that we see pervading today. And we have serious discussions on the political realm, on the sociological realm, on the psychological realm, on the anthropological realm to assess the types of in decisions and philosophies that are informing every decision that we make. And so brothers and sisters, our duty as the Prophet Sallallahu did was transformative. And so when we come to assess the role of the intellect in our realities, brothers and sisters, this is what is key. When we come to assess the role of this intellect, it is not to submit itself to a pervading philosophy created by man. It is to realize its full potential and that is submission to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And we, when we submit to Allah, we are able to live in this dunya and process this dunya, which is a created being, and use the intellect, which is a in a created being, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, by Allah and by the aid of Allah and through Allah Jalla Jalal. So we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to make us of those who realize the true purpose of the intellect. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to make us of those who are able to utilize the intellect as Allah Jalla Jalal created it to be used. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala make us of those who are able to tap into our intellectual heritage and to see what the great scholars such as Imam Abu Hamil Ghazali and others were able to accomplish as they were able to elevate themselves above the pervading philosophies. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us not adaptive in nature but rather transformational in nature. That we seek to transform our realities and not simply seek fiqh that will justify my day-to-day -day reality. Perhaps brothers and sisters, and I'll close with this, perhaps sometimes it's going to be difficult and that we'll have to be in a bit of pain and we don't have the fiqhi solution to our necessarily our problems, but it's okay. If the challenge is greater, then we must elevate our expectations.